All right, let's get started. Um, super excited for the topic today. So a couple quick things. Uh, one, we're going to talk about objection handling. So if you're running into objections that you get on your cold calls, people saying not interested back to a cold email, maybe you're doing a little bit of social, sliding in the DMs of your prospects uh, in an appropriate way, uh, hopefully, I would I, I would assume. Uh, getting any objections like that, definitely we're going to talk about today. We got two guests that I want to introduce to you guys. We got Taylor O'Brien. He's an SDR manager at Orem. Good to see you, Taylor. Armand, host, founder, 30 Minutes to Presidents Club. So we got both these folks in the house. And our goal today is to give you like a ton of really actionable strategies and tips on how to handle objections. So one other thing, loving the engagement in the chat so far. If you have questions, make sure to pop them into the Q&A. And we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. So first question for you guys is like, what's the objection you get that's giving you the toughest time right now? Drop it into the chat for me. What objections are you getting? That I am not the right person. Full plate, too expensive. What do you guys get at Orem, Taylor? What's the most common yeah, objection you guys get? Too expensive, no budget, budgets are frozen. I'm I'm not the right decision maker. Pretty much run the gamut. Yeah, hopefully the reason why I like to ask this of the audience is hopefully what you're seeing in the chat and what you're hearing so far makes you feel a little less lonely because pretty much all of us, regardless of who we sell to and the solutions we're selling, we get very similar objections budget, we have a solution. And I think right now, a really big one is there are a lot of requirements now around spending. So people are just like more apprehensive, honestly, to look into new stuff. So I wanted to, first, we're going to break this into three parts. We're going to talk like approach and mindset first. We're going to get really tactical with how to handle specific objections. And then we're going to get into like, well, how do we practice this stuff and put it into action? Um, I wanted to, Taylor, kick this question your way first. When we were prepping for this, you said something around addressing the power dynamic between SDR and prospect. You want to tell us a little bit more about what you meant by that and and leveling the playing field? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. So it's no secret, right? I, I coach and mentor and manage SDRs, and SDRs are oftentimes new to the sales game. Sometimes they can be ramping. Um, sometimes they may only have a, a, a year into the space. And we're calling into highly sophisticated, seasoned, tenured sales professionals, CROs, CROs, VPs. So right off from the jump, that power dynamic is that play where, you know, there, there, there's a status change there. But first of all, we have to remember that we're all human, right? We're calling another human being, connecting with them on our genuine voices. But one thing that, in my opinion, like first thing immediately that jumps to mind is we don't want to feed into that power dynamic any more than it may already exist. So, and that starts off with A, your pre-call research and making sure that you can really even uncover what your objection may be if you're calling into somebody with proper strategic research. And also when you finally do get that connect, that first 30 seconds to a minute is crucial for making sure that you level that playing field and level that status. And it starts off with that opener and not being apologetic whatsoever. Don't open up a call and being like, I'm sorry I interrupted your day, or I'm sorry if I caught you from out of the blue. Why are you sorry? Immediately, that's making you appear to be low status. Um, so that's my first tip. I, I I have a few more, but would love to hear thoughts from, from you and Armand for, for kind of that that psychology behind the, the power dynamic that might be at play. Yeah, let's like dig into the power dynamic thing a little bit. Let us know. Give us a guess in the chat if you have ever felt that when you were calling a prospect, you were like, holy smokes, this person's got way more experience than me. What could I possibly have to offer? Or, wow, do they even need any help? This person has been doing this for a decade. Okay, I deal with this all the time, you guys, like especially in sales conversations too, where I might be talking to like a VP of sales that's got like 15, 20 years of sales leadership experience which is about the same amount of sales experience I have in, in entirety. You know, it's, it's intimidating. Armand, you've, I, I think that you have a unique perspective in that like you've, 
You've been at so many different ends of the spectrum, rep, manager, VP of sales, the stuff that you're doing at 30 Minutes to President's Club. Like from a mindset standpoint, for someone listening or watching this that's that deals with this kind of reluctance, like what do you suggest that they do to kind of like level the playing field like up here to actually maybe kind of believe that so that what comes out of their mouth sounds like, hey, I'm talking to a peer. For sure. So you've been trained your entire life to tighten your comms up into a box. You go into a class, you're supposed to sit up, you're not supposed to talk unless you're spoken to. You go into a room, you're supposed to be formal, set a really, really tight agenda, keep things to time. And what you'll realize is I was fortunate enough to make VP of sales at a relatively early age. And a lot of people will ask, what's the key? Did you learn all these things professionally? Yada, 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 yada. How do you punch above your weight class? The number one thing that you should take away from today is think it, say it. I think, Sonny, you hit on it early in your career where a lot of people think that in order to be professional, you need to be formal. And that's actually the farthest thing from true. Your goal should not to be give people more respect than they deserve. Your goal should be to be respectful, but also to expect respect in return. So to make this tactical and give you an actual example, if someone slams you on the phone with, I'm not interested, or if they interrupt you, you open your cold call and they're like, look, I know this is a cold call, right? Can, can you get on with it? A lot of people will try to cram their pitch from 60 seconds into 15 seconds and talk at a million miles per hour. And that's not what you're going to do. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to stand tall and you're going to own your space. And you might say something like this, Jason slams me with, look, can you get on with it? I'm going to say like, shoot, my pitch must have really sucked today. I guess, could I get the next 15 seconds for you to not hang up on me? I'll tell you what I do. And then you slam it really hard when it hits the ground and you'll get a good laugh and you'll show that you're comfortable in your own skin. And especially if you're calling someone who's sold before, you'll probably get someone being like, all right, I got you. Give me your 15. That's it. Yeah. Woo. So think it, say it. Um, I think there's something underneath there too that, uh, I don't know, let, let me know in the chat. Does anyone here have sales experience going door to door, like literally knocking doors? I used to sell house painting services door to door. Yeah, let me know in the chat. Anyone here got door to door experience? So one of the things that just, Armand, to your point that I always thought about was I had a bit of an ego around it where I'm like, I'm not going to let this person get the best of me or change my emotional state. And there's a certain pride that's like, hey, dude, like, I don't care what kind of day you're having, but it's not going to affect my day. And I think if you approach it like that, where it's like, you're going to catch people in all kinds of different mental states, and that doesn't have to affect your mental state. And going into that conversation and like what I heard from both of you is like not needing something from this person. Outside of, I'm going to have my own respect and dignity in this activity that I do. And I'm not going to let this person ruin my day. And if they don't want to talk to me, that's okay. But like, I have control over the part that I want to execute here. The things that I want to say and how I want to respond to this. So, okay. Now, you pointed out something, Taylor, around there's like a preparation component of this that I think is super important as we dig into objections. The idea here is to prevent objections. And I think that if we kind of go into that angle, in that first 30 to 60 seconds, Taylor, what are some kind of like telltale signs or no-nos that we want to make sure to avoid that actually invites objections from prospects? Like the not interested and I'm about to step into a meeting. What are some of the things that we want to avoid to really prevent those instead of inviting them? Yeah, I really appreciate that question, Jason. I the the first thing that comes to mind for me, um, I love talk tracks, right? I love talk tracks so much; it's a north star. But I definitely encourage teams to caution about sticking too rigidly to a talk track. And what I mean by that is, oftentimes in our talk tracks, we have okay. If somebody says, "Oh, I have no budget," this is the response that I want to say to them. 
So during the, the conversation we have with a prospect, our brains are automatically like hardwired to listen for like that first objection that that's on your piece of paper that we were trained to respond to. But oftentimes we can overlook the underlying root of that problem, which is making that objection come up. We can just glaze over it because we're so focused on finding what that objection is and listening for it. So really in a simplistic terms, this is active listening, right? But like, I like to call these fishing hooks to my team. Like what are some fishing hooks in a conversation that you can latch onto? Um, and that could be like, if I'm selling, if I'm selling Orem, for instance, which as people on the, on, on the line know that we're a live conversation platform, you know, I might say, Hey, Armand, you know, just curious, do you have reps who are, are outbound dialing like I am today? And our mind might say, yes, we do, Taylor, but unfortunately, like, I have no budget. And I might say, ah, glad to hear that your team is making dials. I completely understand with the state of the economy that your budget may be frozen. But with that being said, is it safe to assume that you're with the, that with your outbound motion, that your goals may have remained the same, but more than likely they've gotten bigger? Yes, that's true. Well, okay, well, what's your strategy to getting to your goals with a frozen budget. It sounds like you need to do more of less. And actually, that's the reason why I'm calling. So, you know, if if I was just solely focused on listening to the budget, I may have just glazed over the fact that, hey, they are dialing. They are still reaching out to prospects. They do still have goals that they have to hit. And that is the value that I want to provide with my value prop. But if I'm sticking too rigidly to my talk track and not active listening, I'm going to completely miss that. Yeah, so there's there's kind of a, a bit there to unpack. The the first thing that with that objection is you you acknowledged what the person said to you, and then you sort of like got above the objection. Um, I think there's so much to oh man, if if uh, there's so many different avenues that we can take this conversation from here, but there's something to like being able to speak to what a prospect actually does like the goals, priorities that people like them typically have and the outcomes that they're driving. And then the problems that typically get in the way and making the conversation about that versus making the conversation, do you want to buy my solution? And the number one, like sort of motto, I guess you could call it that I have with prospecting is don't prospect to make a sale, prospect to start a conversation. If we're really just trying to have a conversation with the person. So if we think about the framework, Armand, um, what what is kind of like if we step back from how to handle and respond to these? What is kind of the overarching framework? And I think you have something. Is that Mr. Miyagi framework? Is that what you call it? Correct. <laughs> I do look like Bruce Lee, which is the wrong karate movie, but the Mr. Miyagi framework. So let's take a step back, right? If there are only a couple things that you remember in terms of how to handle any of the objections we discussed today. There are three steps that I like to take to handle any objection. Step number one, agree with the objection. Step number two, incentivize them to share more. Step number three, sell the meeting, not the product. Okay. So let's break that down step by step. If there's one thing you should practice a lot, it's step number one agreeing with the objection. So if someone says, call me in six months, you should know how to agree with that objection every single time. If someone says, um, send me some information, you should know how to agree with that objection. Agreeing with the objection sounds like, hey, I totally get it. I should have realized right now with the whole economy thing, everyone's heads down and you weren't going to be looking at a tool like us today. I've taken the pressure of the sale off of the prospect by agreeing with their objection. Step number two, this is the Mr. Miyagi, the wax on, wax off. Step number two, I need to incentivize them to give me information. The easiest way to incentivize someone is to simply say, just so I make, just so I make sure that no one else reaches out to you. Because no one wants to be reached out to 17 more times. So I might say, just so you don't want to be, just so that no one else reaches out to you again in the next six months, could you give me a sense of what's going on? And now I'll get them to share a little bit more around what is happening in six months. And then from there, I'm going to sell the meeting, not the product. 
and selling the meeting is not, hey, we can solve this, this, and this today, right? It's even if you don't buy between now and six months, we can give you something of value in that meeting that you can take away forever. And so selling the meeting might say, hey, Jason, my guess is you're not going to buy anything for the next six months, and I'm not going to expect that of you. Sometimes people know their budget is going to open up in six months or whatever you said is going to happen in six months. And they want to get the whole like demo and the dog and pony show thing out of the way so they can get a sense of what's out there today so that later on in six months, they can just make their decision. So do you want to take a look for 15 minutes? And hopefully by the end of it, you'll know if this is a fit or not. And so I've said in 15 minutes, you're going to be able to do a harbor tour. You're going to get a sense of what we do. And I'm not going to explicitly explicitly push you to buy right then and there. So you will get something out of the meeting. And hopefully that ends up being my product. Love it. The Mr. Miyagi framework. We'll talk about that in a second. But we have to address what people are talking about in the chat, Armand. Is that some sort of ghost oh, uh, above your right? See, I have the worst fan. place. This is like a ceiling <laughs> fan, or it's like some, it's a good luck charm that I have right here. I got to move these things, but that's, that's very, it's very observational from the audience. Good for you. <laughs> Christopher said he hit it when he waxed on. <laughs> Sonny, the force is strong with this sales leader. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys are hilarious. Um, so agree, incentivize, sell the meeting, not the product. One quick comment on the sell the meeting part. Um, this is something I've worked on with a lot of companies. I think it depends on like kind of what you sell, but the incentive for like Orem, if I was thinking about if I wanted to take a meeting with Orem and learn something outside of the demo of, of Orem and like seeing the actual platform, I think the question you guys have to ask yourself is if the prospect takes a call and they decide not to move forward after that call, what are they going to take away from that outside of learning about your platform? What is the thing that they're going to walk away with? And like with Orem, or I, I do this a lot, a lot of the incentive is I'm going to share how Gong, Medallion, and a few other companies of that size are getting their AEs to self-source 30 plus percent of pipe right now. Mm -hmm. Like I'll share some strategies. If nothing else, you walk away with a few ideas you're free to steal. And I think that you got to really think about if you're an SDR, what is the AE going to share with them? Not the qualification, not the demo of the platform. Like, what are they going to walk away with? You got to have that. And then for me, the conviction is really high when I know that they're not going to waste their time if they decide to take 20, 30 minutes with me. Um, so the, the, uh, the selling the meeting part, I think, is super huge. Uh, Taylor, what, what comes to mind for you? Like when you think about the selling the meeting, not the product, how do you work with your reps at Orm? Because you guys do an excellent job of this too. Yeah. But what does that that part kind of sound like for you guys? We're we're a little lucky here at Orem because our our you know our persona is other sales development managers and sales leaders in the space. So by selling the meeting for us, it's not just seeing a demo of our platform. It's like we try to pride ourselves on being like best in class SDRs. Like we, our whole foundation is built off of cold calling. So it's like, okay, like come take a demo with us. You're not only going to see the product, but we're going to do coffee and cold calls. So you're going to see me on the phone as an account executive ripping dials live. You're going to hear like our objection framework. You're going to hear how we close a deal. How you may even hear us book a meeting over the phone, right? And you're going to be able to take what we use and what we leverage with our reps and even if you don't buy Orem or not, you're going to take everything that you've learned in that half hour to 45 minutes and be able to apply that directly to your sales development team like today. Um, so it's an easy sell for us because it's 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 fun. It's like we're all in the trenches. We're all in the space. Um, we can laugh about the rejections. We can celebrate celebrate over the wins. And, and that's even beyond just taking a demo for us. That's beyond buying a product. That's valuable insights that you can walk away without spending a dollar. Yeah. I think the insight part is so big. It's a, and I think people overcomplicate this. The insight doesn't have to be this like our presentation that you give someone. The insight is simply what's a similar customer uh, like them doing with your solution. That's, that's like getting them a great result. And it's not how they're using the solution. It is like the strategy or tactic that they use the solution to drive. Right. So for me, I'm not going to talk to someone about playbooks and like, workshops and stuff like that. I'm going to talk about like, hey, with your AEs, how are they prioritizing their top accounts right now? I can run you through how they're 
you know, cherry picking their top 10 or 20% that are going to be most likely to respond so that if they only have an hour to prospect every day, they're going to be doing it in a way that has the highest chance of success. Like that's, that's an insight. I could just talk about that, you know? Um, okay. I want to ask everyone in the chat, cause this is a really big piece. Like what is something valuable and insight that your prospect can take away from that first meeting? If they decide to engage in a sales process with you guys, or at least take a meeting, what's one thing that they would take away that would be valuable, even if they decided not to continue moving forward with you guys? Drop it into the chat for me. What's something that your prospect would take away and learn that would make that time valuable for them? Yeah, be specific as you, if you can. So knowledge, what kind of knowledge? Someone's on a competitor. Run. There are a lot of good ones too. Think about those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What might you want to know if you're driving a Honda Civic and you're touring or you're test driving a Tesla? Yeah. Yeah, Isaac nailed it there. How competitors are leveraging our tech. And if you sell something, that you can show people stuff too. What's really interesting is you can show, I'm just thinking... People that sell marketing software can have a, a bit of a luxury because you can see stuff going on on a landing page or a website. Like you can show examples of what good and bad looks like, right? There's so many things that you can show people. So just think about what that insight is. What is something that they can take away and put into action after that call? Okay. So let's take this uh, Mr. Miyagi framework and, and let's just let's start going through some objections. So feel free in the Q&A, you guys, if you got an objection specifically that you want us to go through like Manuel did, drop it into the Q&A and we'll kind of go back and forth here. So Armand, this, this is a, a request for you, dude. Manuel says, can you provide an example on how to use your Mr. Miyagi framework with this objection? We love our current solution. We aren't having the issues the other prospects told you they're having. You can't help me. <laughs> they really piled it on there. Okay. So just to make it more broadly applicable, we'll, we'll, we'll strip out the piling it on aspect of that objection. And let's just talk about the competitor objection in general. Again, you'll get this all with the Mr. Miyagi framework. I'm not selling them. In fact, I'm pushing away the sale. So step number one, agree with the objection. Hey, Jason, I should have assumed that you guys were already using something like that. It would have been crazy if you didn't have insert X solution here. Just so I make sure that no one else calls you again. Could you give me a sense of what you're using today? And if you love it, 10 out of 10, or if it's something that you might consider replacing in a year. So I'm getting a little bit more. I'm trying to see if I can open up one crack in the armor. But again, I'm giving them the option to say, I will never, ever, ever leave the software again. No matter what they say, I've gone from now incentivizing them to share more to now selling the meeting. So back to Jason's question, what can I offer someone of value if they are driving the competitive car, right? If they're driving the Civic and I own the Tesla dealership, Again, I'm not trying to rip them out of the Civic today, but don't you want to test drive the Tesla? Don't you want to know how much you can save in gas? Don't you at least want to know if there are a couple cool things that you could play around with in case you decide to buy another car in three years? And so all I'm going to say is I'm going to say, Jason, my guess is you're not going to leave your Honda Civic. My guess is it, it rarely makes sense to drop a tool like that over the next six to 12 months, right? You know, the, the other day we had like two or three customers jump off of that tool for a few different reasons that I could share. But again, it usually doesn't make sense. And, but would you be completely against chatting when I'm not calling you out of the blue and I can share what those two or three things are? And if nothing else, you'll at least know what else is out there. You'll know what it costs, right? And in case something goes wrong, you'll at least know that you have another option on your hands. And yeah. usually people will say yes to that. How intentional, Armand, there's some phrases and words that you use often when objection handling. It kind of fits into this disarmingly blunt thing that I feel like you and Nick are like becoming well known for. <laughs> it, it's stuff like, this is probably not even going to make sense. 
it's phrases like that. How intentional is it when you say yeah. things like that? It's the, it's uh, Jason, you do a really good job of talking about the intent behind it. Focus less on the words that I'm saying, focus more on the intent behind those words. The intent that I'm trying to say is like, I'm not going to push you to buy something, right? You're probably not going to buy this thing. I might throw in a joke that it's like, hey, if nothing else, you could throw me a bone and at least I can tell my manager that I booked a meeting and gave it a good swing, right? At least you could say that you donated to the I booked a meeting off of a cold call charity today, things like that. Things that just take the edge off of the sale and show someone that I'm yeah. human. Come up with your three or four phrases and just weave yeah. them in. And the one that you picked up on, I use all the time, which is just like, my guess is this isn't even going to be a thing over the next six months. Yeah. So again, it, it kind of fits into that agreeing with the person. And it's, it's like, ugh, I know that uh, this is, this is going to maybe date me a little bit, but the, the nineties, like Hugh Grant in the rom-coms, like when you can bring that kind of energy, like that playful energy to a conversation, I think it just works so well uh, over a cold call. I have an idea too, but I want to get Taylor's thoughts first competitors. So people that say they're already using a competing solution, or maybe they have their own solution, that sort of stuff. How do you guys handle that? Yeah, but this is credit to our, our VP of sales. Shout out to Colin. Uh, he is a yeah. great one when it comes to um, dealing with like the competitor conversation. And it's all about, again, the, the tone and the intention and stuff like that. But he goes and he's taught us to say, hey, can I, can I tell you what they're going to say about us? Like, just like that, right? Are you opposed to hearing like what they're going to say about us? And just by kind of addressing the elephant in the room and, and saying like, hey, you know, like they're going to say that we don't do this or we don't do that or we don't do this. It's actually going to open up the room for you to go in and actually be like, actually, they may say this, but we do X instead. This is how we, this is what we really mean when we say this. So I love that line. We've been using it across our whole team when the competitive um, conversation comes up and I think it can be a game changer. So someone says uh, we're using, I don't know, I won't say any, any of the names uh, of your competitors, just so we don't give them the spotlight here. <laughs> when someone says ABC competitor and the response is, um, oh, hey, that's great. You know, Glad you're taken care of here, uh, et cetera. Um, and then you use that line right after that. Um, hey, would you be opposed to hearing like what they say about us? And then you go in and, and are, how strategic are you with the, what they say about us part? What are the things that you say? Yeah. So it's, it, it goes back to your, to your pre-call research, right. And, and having your competitive knowledge already kind of stored in your brain. So definitely have like your, your battle cards written out, know your competitors well, know what their um, positives and what their negatives are. So that way you do have that aim to come back and be like, this is what they're going to say, but this is what we really do. Um, so it's all about that preparation. Like if you are going to go down that route, like you better make sure that you're direct and can come up with those rebuttals and those objections on the spot. Yeah. If I could add one thing here, especially when it comes to competitors, a lot of people try to memorize an entire battle card. And mm -hmm. if you have 17 competitors and you need to remember five pluses and five, five negatives, you're, you're going to get totally wires crossed on the phone. Mm -hmm. So step one is learn the generic Mr. Miyagi, right? Which is generally there are things that would lead you to rip and replace. But the next level of that is if you can remember one dart per competitor, that is a dangerous person on the phones. So one dart. In other words, one thing you know you always do better than that competitor. So for example, I used to sell a compensation software called PAVE. And I knew that our competitors handled cash compensation well, but they really did not do a good job of handling equity compensation well. And so if I ever came up on one of those competitors, I would again say, hey, my guess is you're not going to switch. But um, just before I let you go, I'm, I'm curious, you guys aren't doing stock option planning or anything like that, right? Because normally that, that wouldn't be a thing with them. And that's the first question you can use, the dart you can throw to get them to be like, hold on, wait, what do you, no, we don't do that with them. And now you can go and transition to how you beat that competitor. Yes. 
I cannot stress the importance of this, just whether prospecting or selling, you guys, part of being a trusted advisor, being someone that your prospect wants to speak with and treat like a consultant is you got to know the competitive landscape. And a big part of that is like how you stack up pros and cons. And that's my approach. I It's a kind of a variation of what you two just mentioned. I love pros and cons. So when someone is using a solution, same kind of thing, acknowledge it. Hey, sounds like you're taken care of. I, I figured, you know, you're probably already using, I was just doing this for another client. You're probably already had a CRM. I sort of figured that, right? So you acknowledge. The next piece is figuring out like, mentioning pros and cons, but doing it in a way that gets the prospect to kind of lean in and think about something that they're not able to accomplish right now. So I'll give you a different example. This is a client that sells into like contact center leaders and one of their biggest competitors, one of the biggest companies in the in the world that does this is like survey software. So oftentimes they get lumped into this bucket where we're already using XYZ competitor for surveys. Okay. So it sounds something like this. Hey, glad you're using the ABC company. Um, they're really great at capturing survey data and all that kind of stuff. And if you don't mind me asking, a lot of times with our customer support leaders that we work with, they really love being able to capture survey data you know, from customers. They use it to improve the product, all that kind of stuff. But one thing they find that it doesn't really capture, and I don't know about you, most people don't leave surveys. And a lot of our customers are looking for ways to capture feedback that customers share over the phone, in emails, support messages, and using that to improve their customer experience, how are you getting that information right now? And you're able to like talk about like what that competitor does well, which when you do that, it doesn't feel like you're poking at them or accusing them. No one wants to feel like they chose the wrong solution, you know? So pros, one thing that people really like, I'm using customer voice. A lot of the people that really like, like this thing. And one thing they find they're not able to do is this. And you can kind of poke and prod around the pros and cons of something. But this really requires you to Armand's point to have that one dart. Like you need to know the area where you win. So homework for an SDR, BDR, if you don't know that, ask your account executives when they get into competitive deals, the ones that they win, why did they win them? What is the ultimate reason why they win? That's something that you can use to inform how you objection handle. Boom. Unbelievable. I love the you give them two or three things that competitor is good at, right? Sales goon versus 30 minutes to present. Everyone loves sales goon. Their podcast guests are far less good looking. So they seem very attainable and reachable, right? They're less charismatic. <laughs> People love those guys. One thing they don't like about sales goon is this, right? Have you heard of that? It's amazing. It gets them to put their guard down. Yeah. 100%. Um. Okay, let's get to the next one. Humberto, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And again, if you guys have an objection that you want us to work through, drop it into the Q&A section here of Zoom and we'll we'll go through it. Uh, Humberto says, we're working really good right now. We don't need anything. There's kind of a lot of variations of this objection, but it's like the, hey, we're good right now. This is not a priority, et cetera, et cetera. Taylor, how do you guys, how do you guys approach this one? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good one and that's a common one. And Again, for myself personally and how I coach my reps is I want to figure out the root and the why. Okay, what's working really good? You know, why is it working so good? Try to uncover more information and get them to keep talking. Cause again, you want to go back to those fishing hooks that you can latch into to hopefully uncover more pain that you can solve for. Um, so so that's where I would go with that for sure. Got it. Armand, what do you think? Could you repeat the objection one more time? I saw Umberto's uh, cute question. And I want to make sure I address it correctly. Yeah. We're working really good right now. We kind of don't really need anything. Yeah. So it's it's basically like we've got it taken care of, but it's it's a little bit ambiguous as to if that's a competitor or if it's just a we've got it taken care of, right? So again, we're just going to follow this one through, right? So the first thing is agree with the objection. Hey, I totally should have figured. I mean, you guys are 500 employees. And if you didn't have something in place, that one's on me for not realizing that. Just so no one calls you again, could you give me a sense? Is it you're doing something internally? You're using a solution like X, Y, or Z? Or was it I cold called you at the wrong time and you really hate getting cold calls? One of those three. 
they're going to give me an answer. And again, depending on what that answer is, I'm just going to sell the meeting. So uh, let's assume that we've already handled the competitor one. And they say, no, we've got it taken care of internally. Right? All I'm going to do is follow that same sell the meeting framework. So if someone's doing something internally, eventually they might decide that they want to use a solution. Right? And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to make it really, really easy for them to select a solution six months down the road. I'm going to say, Jason, my, my guess is at your stage, like, honestly, I'm super impressed that you've been able to do it internally up until this point, um, which leads me to believe that you're probably going to keep doing it that way for six to 12 months down the road. But sometimes when folks are growing as fast as you guys are, they might consider a solution in six to 12 months. So. I mean, look, can I do this? Can I show you what ours looks like? And also just like as you think about this space, can I give you a sense of how the three or four other folks in the space work? Just so that in six months, if you do decide to bring this out out of house or whatever it is, you at least know what's out there. And so I'm going to tell them not only here's what's there with us, but if you decide to do this later on in general, I'm going to give you a sense of how this space works just so that you don't get stuck with a raw deal. That's it. Yeah. I think one thing that's important to point out too, we talked about this like right before we hit hit go on the webinar today, is reducing friction. So like the mental energy that it takes to respond. And where I'm kind of going with this is like, let us know in the chat, what do you guys think your prospect is doing when they pick up the phone? Besides picking up your cold call, what do you think that you caught them in the middle of? Christopher says, rolling their eyes. Manuel says, fishing. <laughs> yeah, they could be fishing. Yeah, eating emails. Yeah, like doing their job. <laughs> you guys are hilarious. Um, so they're doing something, right? The prospect is doing something else besides sitting around and waiting for you to call. The point being is that they're probably not 100% focused on the conversation that they're having with you. Especially when they give you an objection, like, oh, I'm not interested. They're not really taking the time to process what's going on. And one thing that both of you have done, and I recommend too, is I I love this, give them options. So do you have this taken care of? Or are you experiencing any kind of issues like XYZ customers are experiencing? Right? And it's like giving them options and like doing multiple choice kind of thing. This is what I love about using what I call priority drops in the cold call too. It's like, Hey, people we talk to like you are focused on one, this thing, but they keep running into this thing or two, this thing. And they keep running into this thing. Which one are you focused on? Or is it something completely different? Like making it easy and frictionless to interact with you. I think it's super, super important. So, uh, Umberto, there you go. That's the, we're working really good right now. We don't need anything from you. Let's go to the next one. So. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly too. Jubal, Jubal, response to a cold email with two issues. I'll get back to you if XYZ is something we need. The problem is XYZ isn't what we do. So Armand, I'll throw this one your way first. So prospect responds back to an email. I think the same thing could apply in a cold call too, but there's some confusion around what you do. For me, oftentimes I sell sales training. Sometimes people think that I'm a, like a cold calling solution, right? Or Taylor, I, I'm assuming some people might think that like, okay, are you like a sales engagement tool? Like we already have one of those, you know, kind mm-hmm. of thing. So time. Armand, what do you think? Um, I'll get back to you if XYZ is something that we need, but the the prospect clearly doesn't quite understand what it is that you do. Answer number one, call them. Always. That is the number one thing that you can do right now. Pick up the phone, call them. Because the reason is what this requires is this is an especially dangerous objection to handle over the phone because I can't handle the objection without getting more information. And the likelihood of me getting more information after someone has already rejected me over email by responding with another email is is simply very low, right? So number one, look at their signature. If their phone is there, like call them right now. Chances are they're probably available if they're answering emails or they're multitasking in a garbage meeting. 
And if you can get them on the phone, if you cannot, you need to take one stab and one very thoughtful stab, right? Because chances are, if you sent them this email and you totally missed the mark, right? This feels like it's a slightly unresearched email and you hit them with a value prop that might not have been addressed to their situation. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the mini Mr. Miyagi method. What's the kid's name? I don't even remember his name. Someone put it in the chat. Daniel Son. kid's name. What? Daniel Son. Daniel Son. We're going to do the Daniel Son <laughs> method, right? The Daniel Son Miyagi method. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to agree with the objection shortly, right? And then we can't really incentivize them to give us more information because I'm the chances of me getting a response again and then handling the objection is almost zero, right? So I'm going to say, as Daniel son, hey, Jason, totally my bad. Um, clearly, I've got to work on my prospect researching. My VP of sales is going to kill me, right? Because I totally missed the mark here. If you could let me take one more swing and a miss, I noticed XYZ is something that I saw on your website. That leads me to believe that typically we can help with problem A, B, C. Could you let me know if that underline is even moderately interesting or if I've missed the mark twice and I should be reported back to my manager? And that's what I would set in return. And if nothing else, you're going to get a response. Yeah. No, I love that. The uh, the other th- tweak that you can make to that, which I'm sure you do a lot, Armand, too, is like weaving in the customer story for that. So it's like, um, hey, totally my bad. Looks like I missed the mark here. I was reaching out to you because you reminded me a lot of XYZ company who had a lot of FAQ pages on their website. And it looked like they were trying to get customers to solve their own issues versus calling into the contact center. And one of the ways that we helped them was by reducing, you know, incoming call volume by XYZ percentage and reducing the cost to serve. Is that remotely close to something that you work on or even care about, you know, kind of thing. So like, if you can weave in the customer story of like, oh, I was reaching out to you, you look like this customer, social proof. They were doing this thing and running into this problem and here's how we help them. And it's like speaking to the customer in a language that they understand that doesn't involve feature function, any of that kind of stuff. It's very powerful. Uh, Taylor, what about you? Anything that you like to do? We'll get back to you if XYZ is something that we need. You hit the nail on the head, Jason, with uh, with the case studies, you know, of of a relevant customer in their industry that we work with, that we solve the same problem that we thought that they might have in the prospect. Just being like, sorry if I was off base, you know, we we noticed that XYZ company in your space is experiencing these problems. We thought that this may resonate with you. Um, so I would start there to your point with the case studies, but another thing that I, I oftentimes recommend if we can't get the reps on the phone at that moment, shoot them a video, go onto your video or your loom or whatever, go onto their website, have your little bubble in the corner and be like, I'm so sorry. I swung and missed there. Or if you thought I was off base, but this is like, by looking at your website, this is what I'm uncovering might be a problem for you. And this is what we solve for. So by sending a highly customized tailored video to that specific follow up, um, that that can that can sometimes I get them to really kind of get to the root of that problem and what it might be. Yeah, I I love this approach. So it's like call first. If they don't pick up, I'm gonna pop a video into that email. The other thing too with that video is if you could have their competitor open in the thumbnail. One hundred percent. Yeah. Like, hey, I was giving you a call because ABC competitor. Uh, is doing something really interesting with their whatever uh, category that you help with. I put a quick video in here sharing it with you. Like that is like that can really elicit a response too. Really cool. Um, let's keep going. So Brendan Patman, really good question here. My biggest area I need to improve in is securing the meeting. I'm able to capture some attention and get them to open up on the phone. I often lose the appointment too. Can you send me? over some more information in the email, overall, just looking for help to get the meeting book. So Taylor, we'll kick this question your way first. The yeah. alternative, hey, this sounds really awesome. Can you send me some more information or can you send me an email? Right, love one it. of the more common objections. Love it, guess. love it. Yeah, one one we hear hundreds of times a day at, at, at Orem. So 
in my opinion, it goes something like this. Like, hey, Taylor, can, can, you, can you send me an email? And I might be like, hey, Jason, absolutely. I'm happy to send you an email. You know, certainly don't like, I don't want to waste your time. Like, what's like the, the three things that are most important for you that I can highlight in this, in this email that we've talked about, like in the past 30 seconds on this cold call. And that way you get them to open up about what's most important for them. And if they don't answer, then, you know, Hey, it's, it's a waste of time. This prospect is just trying to get me off the phone in the first place. Right. So it kind of helps you uncover like which side of the, of the, of that they might be on. Yeah. So getting them talking, basically being able to sniff out whether it's BS or not. Armand, I know you probably have a disarmingly blunt way to handle this one. <laughs> there are a lot of them. Um, so yes, always agree with the objection. Totally. I'll send you some information. I shouldn't have assumed you would have been able to read the PDFs of us and all this stuff. You want to do your research. I buy things the same way. I get 17 tabs open on Reddit when I want to buy a hot dog. Okay. And just so I send you the right stuff, do you want the hot dog A PDF or the hot dog B PDF? Great. Awesome. Can you ask? Can I ask you a really awkward question too, by the way, because my manager is looking at me and he's looking uncomfortable. Yes. Jason, sometimes I make a lot of these cold calls and I know you don't like getting them and I really don't like making them. But sometimes when I hear send me some information, people are just way too nice to me because they know I'm in sales and they just really want me to go away. Would it actually be helpful if I sent you that stuff? Or do you just not want me to cold call you again? Because that's totally fine. And you'll get the real answer there. Uh, and if they say, no, 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 actually send me some information because they're being nice. Here's a little twist that you can put at the end. If they say, no, 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 do send me some information, just an overview, stuff like that. I'm window shopping or I want to I want to know before I take the meeting with you. Yes, and. It's always yes, and, right? There's the Mr. Miyagi that thing for me, right? It's moving. The yes and here would be awesome. So Jason, I'm going to send you X or Y, okay? In parallel to that, um, I'm, I'm just going to throw a dart. There's another dart. I'm going to throw a dart at your calendar, right? And it's going to be something further out of the way, right? It'll be Thursday end of next week, right? Just so you have some time to read it. If you like what you see in there, would you mind just accepting the time so I can actually give you a proper harbor tour of this thing. And if you find it totally uninteresting, that's fine. I would love to just get your feedback on what wasn't interesting and you can decline the invite. And just by creating a little bit less friction such that there's a meeting on the calendar where if you read this thing, you like it, all you have to do is click yes. Guarantee right there. You get some more meetings out of that. Yeah. Love it. Love it. The uh, Armand, on the disarmingly blunt piece, what are, if someone's wanting to lean more into that style, let me know in the chat, actually, how many of you kind of like Armand's uh, disarmingly blunt approach kind of resonates with you and it's something that kind of fits your personality? Let me know in the chat. Give me, give me a yes. Yeah. There's I like that. People like you folks. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit more about that and and kind of like for someone that hasn't really been this, I would use the word bold, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it doesn't just apply to cold calls. I mean, it's, it's the sales calls. It's everything, you know, how could someone get started with that? Yeah. The, the easiest way to get started with it is in a safe space with a bunch of friends and just hanging out, having a good time. It's 3 PM on a Friday. You're outside of the eight year, the SDR bullpen and you play a game. And it's called first reaction. Okay. So everyone in the chat right now, first funny reaction to the following objection, put it in the chat. Just don't put anything offensive there. First funny reaction. You're too expensive. What's your reaction? My first reaction, your mama. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not, not that. Don't be that disarm. That's disarmingly randomly blunt, but I like that. So is your tax bill. Look at that, Ryan. Great one. No kidding. I thought you didn't know, right? I am, but for a good, everything's expensive. I know price, not having a solution is more expensive, not to my clients. I guess you're broke. Ooh, that's really blunt. Okay. Compared to what? Less than a dozen eggs. That's a great one. Oh my God. So right there. So the best answers right there. Guys, those came out in 15 seconds. And, and I said it, you had to react to it and you had to type it out. 
right? The one that came to mind for me was today's the $5 special. Would you like fries with that? And so literally just get good at blurting out the first reaction in a safe space. And then after you get used to just first reaction, get good at first tapered reaction with prospects. So just practice first reaction with friends so you can say something ridiculous that would actually piss off a prospect and then learn to taper it on the phones. And again, just practice that opening agree with the objection line for every objection. And you'll get really comfortable doing this stuff. Yeah. It's really an improv technique. You know, this is something that I struggle with. So like, God, this is back in 2000, this is about 10 years ago, actually 2014 ish around that time. I was like, you know, I need to get out of my bubble and do take like an improv class. And this was like a muscle. I just had never flexed before this, like being in the moment and responding to something as you see it. And then the next kind of level of that is like making that response very natural too. And uh, I think it kind of comes back full circle with Taylor and Amran, what you both talked about at the beginning, where we oftentimes in sales, like we suppress who we are when really we should lean into that. I think personality is your biggest differentiator. It really is. I got a cold, uh, cold outreach from a guy uh, through LinkedIn, which I get a lot of them, as you could imagine. This guy recorded a video because it shows on my LinkedIn profile that uh, I like classic rock and I, and I suggested uh, Van Halen, Def Leppard, ACDC, I think is my what I put in there. The video that he sent me, he had poured some sugar on me by Def Leppard in the first part of the video. And he was just like singing along to it. And it was, it was kind of cheesy, but I'm like, he's just being himself. Like he looks, this just looks like something he would do to his friends. And I was like, I remember that guy. Like he's like a personality. And I'm curious, Taylor, for you with the SDRs at Orem, it's with yourself. How do you, how do you help SDRs? Because Colin does a brilliant job of this too. You, know, How do you get people to just be more of themselves and to get very comfortable and really kind of like show their personality as a way to differentiate when they're on the phone? Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. I mean, we, on, on Fridays, we, we do what's called like a, like a sip and dial session where we are, are calling blitz where the first half hour, we encourage them to grab a coffee or a, or a drink. And we just first, first half hour is happy hour. Right. And we're randomly or vodka or an adult beverage. Like if it's just one drink, like totally. Okay. Oh, you um, guys do a little bit. We just, we just, <laughs> we just loosen up. We loosen up. We have fun. Um, Orem now has a, has a live virtual sales floor. So like we can literally like just get in there and see each other's faces and just, we start ripping dials, start ripping dials and laughing about it. And if we get, if we get a bad rejection, we, we, we laugh about it. Right. If we hear somebody that has like a super good opener or a super genuine response to something like feed into that, bring that out more, you know? So I think just creating a loose atmosphere with your SDRs will naturally allow them to be their authentic self. Um, if you're too strict, if you're too rigid, if you have too much of a formal process, it's going to be hard for them to unlock that voice. Yeah. I think you mentioned something that's so just clutch. The virtual sales floor. I think about our mind. You've made a lot of references for, oh, my manager's right over there. Like think about when you go to an office, because that's sort of how I grew up in sales was call centers. Well, I did door to door force first, but then call centers. It's like you have the energy. We call it the hum. You hear that hum. There's a lot of people talk. There's this energy on a sales floor. And when you're doing virtual sales or remote sales, excuse me, and you're sitting in your home office, like I am here, it's pretty freaking lonely and your energy level is going to be much lower. It's kind of like working out by yourself at your apartment gym and no one's in there versus going to a work, like an orange theory class, you know, huge, huge difference in your energy level. Do you want to just real quick tell us, Taylor, like how does the virtual sales floor work? And, and you guys should definitely go check out, check out Orin, but what's, what's the concept of the virtual sales floor? What is it? What does it yeah. look like? What's it like to be in in the virtual sales, sales floor? All that kind of stuff. Virtual sales floor is 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 bringing the buzz back to exactly to your point, Jason. It's replicating that live in person boiler room, as they say, type of atmosphere where everybody's calling, everybody's got their headsets on, everybody is virtual. You can see their faces. But the great thing about the virtual sales floor is you can literally tune into somebody dialing, hear the recipient's response over the phone, hear the objections. Um, and then if you're if you're not tuned into that um, conversation, 
you can just be talking casually with your friends. So it's a it's a great way to great way to replicate that in person energy of a, of a sales floor. Yeah, I think one of the biggest benefits, like imagine on a Zoom call like this, is that when our mind connects to a cold call. Like we're not like all listening to him. I can just go pop in his virtual mm-hmm. hubby, so to speak, and just listen. Yeah, it's it's pretty badass, dude. So def- definitely recommend checking that out. Um, Armand, before we take off, where where can people go to connect with you, learn more about what you're up to, all of that stuff? And I'll drop these links into the chat for everyone. Make sure to check out Orm. You can connect with each of us on LinkedIn there. We also got a free cold calling course that we just put together that's pretty badass. Make sure to check that out. Armand, where can people go to connect with you? Easiest way, find me on LinkedIn. There's a link right there. There's only one person with a weird name like mine. And then, of course, I run a the show, amongst other things, called 30 Minutes to Presidents Club. If you liked what you saw today, uh, go check out Jason's episode on 30 MPC. He has multiple of them, and all of them are quite good. Uh, the other thing, too, I think I'm doing like a guest... Uh... Oh, don't get it right. or something like that. Okay. Yeah. So we can't spoil it. He's going to be on it. But all I'm going to say is Jason's going to have a big appearance on 30 MPC in about a month. So keep your eyes peeled. Awesome. Awesome. So make sure to check those links out. Orem's in there. Connect with us on LinkedIn. Let's blow these guys' uh, LinkedIn profiles up. Check out the free cold calling course. Taylor, Armand, it's great having you too. And everyone else. Appreciate all the interaction, all that kind of stuff, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Appreciate your time, everyone. We'll see you. Blast, folks. Thanks, guys.